After the narrow escape from the Shawnees, they hurried through the woods, Wayne pausing from time to time to listen and check their back trail before moving swiftly onward. After a couple of miles, they came upon the deceased Ephraim Kane's canvas tent. While Wayne stood guard, he placed the flintlock against one of the poles and then proceeded to undo the blanket pins that held the canvas together. Then removing the rifle to a nearby tree, he came back and made sure that the pins were securely fastened and would not fall out. Quickly then, he removed the canvas from around the poles and tossed it aside. He began to shift his gear around to make room for wrapping the canvas around his bedroll. It was far too valuable an item to be left behind. With careful and deliberate fingers, he rolled the canvas, brushing off any leaves or debris that had gathered on it. He buckled the heavy leather strap around the canvas and then lashed it to the bottom of the knapsack using some of Ephraim's leather cords. That job accomplished, he shouldered the knapsack and then began to sling on his other accoutrements one by one. There was no sound of their pursuers, but still Wayne was at full alert while he waited for him to gather and put on the rest of his gear. Wayne's bedroll was still safely tucked away at his own campsite. Tapping Wayne on the arm to let him know he was ready, they took off quickly once more to try and put as much distance as they could between them and the Indians, who could surely not be too far behind. Two hours later, the forest trail opened up into a clearing, and very cautiously, rifles at the ready, they emerged one by one from the concealment of the trees. He indicated by motioning for Wayne to come forward that all was quiet, and so they moved further into the field. He was traveling on further north toward Logan's Fort, while Wayne had plans to head to retrieve the rest of his gear and then visit some distant kinfolk that lived in the area. They clasped hands in a fond farewell, and there was much gratitude in that simple gesture. But without Wayne's rescue, he could very well possibly be dead by the hands of his captors. As he walked away, however, he had little time to dwell on recent events as he must be alert and careful to not fall back into the hands of the savages. Before they were out of sight, however, he lifted his hand in a final farewell to this new friend that he now owed his life to, and then turned and continued on his journey. Three weeks later, and without further incident, he neared the safe haven of Fort Logan. Life was good inside the fort, and the settlers and the frontiersmen were enjoying a quiet evening together. Hello, the fort! Here we go, sir! The great fender traveling up from Tennessee, headed to the Ohio country. To his surprise, Wayne, the seasoned wilderness veteran, had already made it to the fort and was manning the stockade when he approached. After securing the heavy gate, they warmly greeted each other by shaking hands and exchanging pleasantries. They passed on the news that all had been peaceful for the last week, but that they had seen some sign in the area, and so they were optimistically hopeful 
that it would be a quiet evening. Shaking Wayne's hand one more time and glad to be in one another's company again, he turned and started to walk deeper into the fort, but then he remembered that he had trade goods and needed to resupply. After explaining what he was looking for, Wayne pointed him in the direction of one of the cabins where a Mr. Edwards ran a small trading post. As he walked toward the trading post, he took in the sights and sounds of the fort. It did his heart good to see the women folk chatting and working on handcrafts while others were peeling apples. It reminded him much of home and he remembered that he must post his letter to his family before leaving the fort. Bender from down Nashboro way. Nashboro. Well, welcome to Logan Fort. Thank you. Glad to have you. It's good to be here. It's the first time I've felt safe in several weeks. Had a bad run-in with a few of the savages here in the last few weeks. About three weeks ago, as a matter of fact. So, well, you're looking good. Well, thank you. Well, fortunately, uh, Wayne, that you all know, that's been helping around the fort the last few days, yes. uh, he came and rescued me. And uh, I've been, we had to separate, and I've been on my own trail. I'm headed up to Ohio country to build a cabin and going back to get my family and bring them up to settle that part of our what great nation. Weather, what kind of weather have you had? So far it's been good. I've had a bit of rain at nights, but the weather has been pretty decent and the rivers have not been too swollen. All that so is good news. made for good yeah. crossing. I hope you have a very safe trip. Thank you very much. We buy, sell, and trade here. This is a, uh, uh, we're glad to help you if you need anything and you know, it, it, I do appreciate it. Um, I am needing a few items. I have some things in my pack. I'm going to go ahead and, and dig those out and let's uh, see if we can uh, make a trade. I'd, I'd like to get a few of the items you have here, sir. Okay. Standing his rifle in the corner of the cabin, he then proceeded to divest himself of the knapsack and all of his other accoutrements. Then he dug into his knapsack for the items that he had carefully stored there, hoping for a good and fair trade. Well, Mr. Edward, these are a few items that I found. Uh, there was a Mr. Ephraim Kane who unfortunately passed away along the trail. He met in with some Indians and he left some of these goods and he left a note I found in his cache that said that anyone that found these, the, they would be his. And so he has no descendants, no relatives. And so I, I have here for trade, I have a, a, a fine white shirt and it is a little small for me, it doesn't fit too well, but uh, I have that, I'll lay that down there and look at that at your convenience. I believe I am going to keep the cross because uh, that means a lot to me. Well, good luck, maybe. Yes. And then I also found in his pocket. He had this small pocket pistol. Now I have cleaned it and extracted the shot and it does work. Uh, it was heavily greased, as you can see, and it will, it will fire. So I will try to trade that. I also have a couple of handmade moccasins and uh, I would like to trade you for some of those fine moccasins that you have over there. So I have those, I have a tin plate, a pewter tankard, and then I have this fine piece of gold jewelry. Yeah. that uh, I would like to pay for some of the other goods and items if you're interested. James, we'll take all your items, especially the bracelet. Now, I'll need this for, my wife would really like this. So what yes, do sir. you need? Look around. What, all right, thank you, sir. Well, I can tell you right off, I already need a, uh, need a powder horn of powder. Uh, I've been doing some fighting and a little bit of hunting along the way, and so I'm running real low on powder. Uh, I'd also like to get some bacon. It's been a month and a half, two months almost since I had any bacon. I really like that. And then also I'm interested in one of those very fine pairs of moccasins. Which, which bar would you think might would suit you, James? All right. Let me look here. Uh, 
I believe this set will do, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I need to have my powder horn recharged, if you don't mind. Okay, we've got powder right here. And then I would like to have that bacon. Mmm. Okay. Looks like it's fresh cured. Yes, yes. Oh, that's delicious. Yes. All right. Well, sir, there are the items. And if you will, let me fill my powder horn up and then let me know what our difference is. James, we have a fair trade. In truth, I owe you money. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Well, I thank you, sir. I believe that's the most cash money I've had in a long time. It'll be a great help on my journeys. Thanks. Good luck. Meanwhile, Wayne had borrowed an iron stew pot from one of the ladies at the fort and had fixed a large mess of vegetable and buffalo stew using meat from a hunt two days prior. Evening was rapidly approaching and the weather was unusually cool for this time in the summer. He'd already invited his friend to dine with him and had indicated that he also had an extra spot by the stockade wall where he could put out his bedroll for the night. That was an agreeable proposition, so he leaned his rifle against the bench and began to lay about taking off his other items for the evening, as well as to retrieve his pot for a little bit of the stew. The fire felt good, and the company was amenable. Indeed, what more could a man on a long journey desire than good food, good company, and a safe place to sleep? The stew was ready, and so Wayne got up and carried his trencher over to the pot and Using the spoon which had been hanging from the chain, he began to ladle out his supper. He nodded an invitation, so James got up and brought his small copper pot over to the cauldron. Wayne generously dipped out heaping portions of the delicious meal. As soon as their containers were full, they sat back down and then gave a heartfelt thanks for the food they were about to eat. As they ate, they filled the air with inconsequential talk as well as discussing the weightier matters of safety, Indian attacks, and loved ones left behind at home. Soon, however, the discussion turned back to that all-important tool on the frontier, the rifle, and how best to care for it in inclement weather. Do you happen to have a lock cover for your weapon? This is all I have right now. I had a lock cover, I lost it. You need something that covers all that, both sides, like a, kind of like a TV. Mm -hmm. With a generosity not uncommon on the frontier, Wayne reached inside his vest and pulled out a tanned skin, sewn carefully, called a cow's knee, 
and designed to fully cover the lock and keep the powder in the pan dry when tied on by the rawhide strings. Confident that James was becoming a better and more experienced frontiersman, Wayne went back to the stew and continued conversation and what might lie before them as it penetrated ever deeper north into the Kentucky wilderness heading toward Fort Boonesboro and ultimately the Ohio country. Before bed though, it was nearly too dark to see but they were still invited over by some of the older men of the fort to a friendly round of tomahawk throwing. The target was a blade of grass pinned to the slice of the log and they all took turns trying to outdo each other in friendly sport. When it was Wayne's turn, he took careful aim, but it landed a little high. The game over, it was time to lay out the bedrolls and ready themselves for a night of rest. The sky was clear and the night sounds around them were normal and reassuring that there were no enemies lurking about. There was a sentry posted to the night watch and all the other settlers were themselves turning in for the evening. As he usually did, he used his extra shirt, wool shirt, and socks, rolled up together for a pillow. Well, it was time to put on the nightcap. And before they went to sleep, they had to remember to move the stew pot off the fire, or it would be burnt to a crisp before morning. He drifted off to sleep, thinking of his family and the home that he would build for them in the Ohio country. After staying at the fort for a few days to rest and knowing that according to his map he was almost exactly halfway between home and Massey Station and in the Ohio country, he and Wayne set out on the trail once more. But first, they wanted to stop by St. Ace of Spring, down at the base of the fort, to get a drink and to fill their canteen bottles for the trail. Even though the last two weeks had been uneventful, since March there had been several attacks on the trails in the area, and so they were extra wary, and each took a turn standing guard while the other took a drink and filled up their canteen. The water was clear and cold, and he drank deeply, twice, before plunging it once more into the burbling spring to top off the bottle. He fumbled a little with the cork and string, but finally got the bottle properly corked for the trail and, and slung it back over his shoulder. Now it was Wayne's turn, and he gingerly stepped down the slippery bank. Moccasins were quite slippery when wet. After making sure that his bottle was full and that the cork was properly seated, he plunged his hand into the cold water and washed off his face, enjoying the cleansing after the night's rest. They emerged warily from the stream bank, looking first this way and then that. You just couldn't be too careful when your life was at stake. He gestured the all clear signal and Wayne too stepped out. After a brief moment, he looked around 
and then once more they clasp hands and a warm farewell. Perhaps their trails would cross once more as they each headed their separate ways. He to his kinfolk and the other to a new beginning in the valley of the Ohio.